Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of the Congress of the Italian Association of Psychology. And today is a great honor for us to have here Professor Sarah Garfinkel. Sarah Garfinkel is professor at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience at the University College of London, where she leads the Clinical and Affective Neuroscience Group. She completed her PhD in Experimental Psychology at the University of Sussex, and before undergoing a, a, session, a fellowship in Psychiatric Neuroscience at the University of Michigan. At the Brighton and Sussex Medical School, she underwent further training in autonomic neuroscience before trans, uh, moving to UCL in September 2020. Her current work focuses on brain-body interactions, underlying emotion and cognition in clinical groups, with a particular focus on the earth. In 2018, Sarah was elected as one of the 11 researchers on the International Nature Rising Star Index across all STEM disciplines, and in 2021, she was awarded uh, of the Mid-Career Award of the British Association for Cognitive Neuroscience. So, thank you, Sarah. And uh, the title of today's talk is Clinical Neuroscience and the Heart Brain Axis. Thank you. Thank you, it's such an honor to be here. Italy is one of my favorite countries and I'm so happy to be here in this beautiful city with you, so thank you. So I first got interested in the role of the heart when I was doing research into post-traumatic stress disorder. I was based in um, Detroit in America and I was trying to understand fear and how it was represented in the brain. And when I was talking to people with PTSD, they would say the same thing, which is the world is an unsafe place. They felt like the world, the external context was always dangerous. And so my initial experiments was all about manipulating external context. I would put people in safe rooms, I would put pe people in dangerous rooms, and I would try to understand how, thank you, I would try to understand how the role of the external context could influence memory. But I found that really it wasn't the external context. People couldn't use safe rooms in the same way. So there had to be something about internal signals or internal context that was driving fear. And when I was working with these people with PTSD, I would notice very different autonomic profiles. They would have a racing heart, and it made me realize that if I'm trying to understand emotion in the brain, that's not enough, and that we need to study emotion in the body as well. So when we think about senses, we tend to think about vision, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. But these are actually classified as extraceptor senses. That is, they help us tell us something about the outside world. And in contrast, we have proprioception, which is sensing the position of the body in space. And we have interoception, which is a sensing of internal bodily signals. And so we know that the brain and the body are intrinsically and dynamically coupled. Our thoughts, feelings, and perceptions are guided by these internal signals. So our extraceptive senses tell us about the world, but our interoceptive senses tell us about internal signals. And interoception is a relatively recent sense, so it was only identified by Sheringdon in 1906. And since then, there's been a number of fights academically about how to best define it. So in 2016, we had a congress where 100 researchers got together in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we tried to come up with a shared definition, which we published in this white paper which is interoception refers to the process by which the nervous system senses, interprets, and integrates signals originating from within the body, providing a moment-by-moment -moment mapping of the body's internal landscape across conscious and unconscious levels. And I'm going to be breaking this down to you today to talk about the different ways internal signals can impact cognition and emotion using this interoceptive framework. And the organ that I particularly focus on is the heart. 
So while the heart is my principal focus, actually there are many internal organs and many internal systems that can contribute to interception. But again, this is debatable in the literature about what constitutes an interceptive sense. And I recently wrote this review article with my collaborator, Camilla Nord, that was a cover article in Trends in Cognitive Sciences this July. And I and my co-author, Camilla, also the editors and also the reviewers, could not agree about what constituted an interceptive sense. We all had differing opinions. So in order to reconcile that, we came up with this table where green are organs or systems that are universally classified as interception. The amber are where there is more controversy, but some people or most people do. And then red are the areas where some people do, but only a small minority. Um, and while I'm focusing on the heart, um, I'm going to refer a little to other systems as well, because I'm so interested about what constitutes emotion. And really, emotion can be seen in the brain in the sense that we have networks like the salience network and others associated with emotional states. But emotions are also coupled to changes and systems in the body. And my personal perspective is we cannot disentangle emotions from these bodily changes. So when people are asked to say what emotions are associated with different heat maps, cold or hot, you get these reliable patterns. You get cardiac differences with emotional states. You get beautiful pupil dilation responses that also map onto emotion, as well as beat to beat changes in blood pressure. And the idea that emotion is coupled to internal bodily changes is not a new idea. So William James, argued that actually it is the perception and sensing of these internal bodily sensations which give rise to emotional feeling states. That is, emotions are a product of these internal changes. And modern day neuroscience progressed to look at how there is shared architecture underlying both the sensing and focus of internal bodily sensations and emotional experience. So in a number of different experiments replicated from groups around the world, from America to Japan, there were paradigms that got people to focus on their bodily sensations, such as attending to heartbeats, or they got them to experience emotional states. And they did a conjunction analysis to look at shared underlying neuroanatomy, underlying both the experience of emotions and the experience of bodily sensations. And you can see overlapping activation in the insula, which is thought to be this area involved in the sensing of bodily bodily sensations as a means to give rise to emotional feeling states. So in order to really delineate and fully understand how these bodily signals can influence cognition and emotion, I have devised these interceptive um, models that delineate each level through which these internal signals can influence our thoughts, perceptions, and emotions. And in this talk today, I'm going to systematically walk us through some of these levels to show how they are related to different types of processing and how they're changed in clinical groups. A lot of my work looks at the translation of these basic interceptive mechanisms mapping onto processing and how they're changed as a means to see um, uh, selective pathways that are different in clinical conditions. So I'm just going to start off with the nature of the afferent signals themselves. And because I focus on the heart, the system that I look at is cardiac responses, specifically, for example, heart rate and heart rate variability, where we can see differences in different clinical conditions. So in this experiment in nearly 400 individuals, we're interested in how you can have different autonomic patterns in individuals with different clinical conditions. 
So um, controls are individuals in green with no um, clinical diagnosis. And you can see that in all of these other clinical diagnoses, depression, anxiety, mixed depression and anxiety, bipolar, emotionally unstable personality disorder, also known as borderline, schizoaffective and schizophrenia, you have elevations in heart rate at baseline, most strikingly high in schizophrenia, and then if you look at heart rate variability also at rest, then you get systematic reductions in heart rate variability in all of these different clinical conditions. Um, and as many of you know, having high levels of cardiac variability is an adaptive thing. You want your bodily signals to be adaptive. It's adaptive to have flexible responses. You don't want regular responses. And I find it so fascinating that schizophrenia, for example, has a reduction in this bodily flexibility. It's associated with a much more regular heart rate. And I, I really believe that these um, cardiac and bodily changes are fundamental and constitutional to the conditions themselves. For example, there's really interesting longitudinal data in one of the big Swedish cohorts that shows that changes in heart rate, that are it's higher heart rate in healthy young men, a 17 and 18 joining the army, individuals who have a resting heart rate over 80 are 21% more likely to get schizophrenia. And that's before any signs of schizophrenia have come online cognitively. So it's actually a precursor to the manifestation of schizophrenia. So these these, these, these alterations in bodily signals may actually precede the onset of clinical conditions. So as well as measuring the nature of the afferent signals themselves, we can also look at their neural representation. And um, you can do this in different ways. One way that is done is looking at EEG, um, and you can look at the heartbeat evoked potential in the brain, which is essentially the cortical processing of heartbeats. And you can look at the amplitude of this signal. And different populations with changes in emotions, such as emotionally stable, emotionally unstable personality disorder or borderline, have um, uh, changes in this heartbeat evoked potential signal in the brain. So emotional instability is associated with alterations in this cortical representation of heartbeats. And I'm working a lot at the moment with individuals with functional neurological disorder um, and I'm not sure if that's the same term that you use in Italy, but essentially this is a, a condition which is so fascinating because the, they're individuals that can have seizures and we call them functional seizures and they're not epileptic seizures. So in terms of behavior, the behavior looks just like an epileptic seizure. However, you don't have activity in the brain that you see during an epileptic seizure. So it's been a neurological mystery about what underlies these functional seizures. Um, and traditionally, the seizures have been seen as the intersection between psychiatry and neurology because you can't find a neural substrate driving them. However, we've got exciting new data that says actually it's a measure of body-brain integration or this heartbeat evoked potential, the cortical processing of heartbeats that actually predicts one of these uh, functional seizures. So if we look at the amplitude of this heartbeat evoked potential in the brain, then there's no difference in its magnitude in individuals who have epilepsy or functional seizures just below, just before, or sorry, there's no difference in between seizures. So in between seizures, there's no difference in the signal, but just before a seizure, so predicting its onset, there's a drop in this heartbeat evoked potential signal. That is the brain and the body aren't integrated in the same way. And this predicts the onset of a seizure. So this tells us that actually, in addition to just looking at neural activity itself, 
looking at neural activity integrated with these body signals can open up new windows of understanding for behavior and for different clinical conditions. So in addition to the nature of the afferent signals, their neural representation, we can also look at the pre-conscious impacts of the afferent signals and how they change the way that stimuli are processed. And this is more of the fine-grained experimental work that I've been doing. Um, so this capitalizes on techniques that have been used really since the 70s when um, psychophysiology research became very, very popular. And what you can do is you have very brief stimuli and you can time lock them to different parts of the cardiac cycle. So you can time lock them to late diastole, which is actually in between heartbeats, or you can present them and time lock them at cardiac systole when um, it's registered in the brain, which is actually at T wave. And this is when the heart and the brain are in active communication. So if you present a stimuli exactly at T wave, this is when heart brain channel is active. And if you present it at R wave, then this is when this channel is quiet. And so you can see differences in how stimuli are processed dependent on whether they happen at R wave or at T wave. And um, in one of my experiments, I looked at memory encoding. And you can encode memory again either at cardiac systole or T wave when the heart is beating and the heart brain channel is in active communication or at diastole in between heartbeats. So I um, did memory encoding, time lock to either of these points. And then an hour later, I gave people a surprise memory test where I got them to recall words. And they were more likely to forget something if they encoded it exactly when their heart is beating. So reduced memory for things an hour later if they encoded it at cardiac systole. And this finding I extended to memory, which hadn't been done before, but it was um, uh, aligned with this idea, this older idea by Lacey and Lacey, that cardiovascular signals to the brain are thought to have a general inhibitory effect. And while I extended this to cognition, a lot of the previous work had looked at the domain of sensory processing. And um, older work had time locked, for example, um, electric shocks at cardiac systole to see how um, the reflex nociception response differed at cardiac systole relative to um, cardiac diastole, late diastole in between heartbeats when this heart brain channel is quiet. Um, and this work, this older experimental work, also showed a dampening down of processing uh, at cardiac systole, where the nociceptive reflex or the pain response is lower exactly when your heart is beating and your heart and brain are in active communication. So this experimental work, which depends on this short presentation of stimuli at different points in the cardiac cycle, um, is, is able to give us mechanistic insights into how cardiac signals can alter the way that stimuli are processed. Um, and this is my, this is a slide that I included late last night, um, which is my very most recent data, um, which uh, I hope sort of highlights the point that actually we're interested in mechanisms by doing these moment to moment changes in how um, uh, cardiovascular signals change stimulus processing. So looking at this question, but from a completely different angle, um, I'm uh, looking at um, uh, data that we're able to get from women in Ukraine, and we're able to look at stress and pain responses just before and just after the war. Um, so where you see the sharp increase in stress was exactly when the war was announced, and you also get a decrease in pain. And the data that we're using is from the period 
a tracking app flow, which has 40 million users worldwide. So we were able to zoom into 90,000 women based in Ukraine who log daily reports of stress and pain, anxiety and other symptoms. And we're able to see this beautiful effect, which is known as the stress-induced analgesic effect, which is as stress increases, pain decreases. And we're able to see it here through these reports on the period app. And this is complementary to the mechanistic work that shows that these cardiovascular signals can dampen pain. So that's showing it on a moment-moment -moment basis as a function of the heartbeat, and this is showing it at a more chronic level when people are in high states of cardiovascular arousal when they're stressed, their pain reports go down. And you can see that this is a short-lived effect, and it's thought to be a selective survival effect, that when you are in a high state of stress, it is adaptive to have um, pain uh, dampened down. So if you're life is in immediate danger or threat, you're running from a threat, then you're not aware of, your, of the broken glass damaging your feet. You have a potential just to escape. So this is thought to be an adaptive mechanism by which stress can momentarily or um, for a short-lived duration suppress pain. Um, and we also looked, uh, this is also brand new data, so I literally just put it in last night, but to show you that it really is a, a somewhat selective effect um, that happens, we were able to get the odds ratio from um, Europe um, and beyond, looking at the, the effect of stress um, on pain, looking at the odds ratio, um, and this is just around the period of the war, and you can see that this Oz ratio is vastly increased in Ukraine, which is the red country there. It's hard to see, but the next highest is actually Russia. Um, and then you can see the effect to a lesser extent in the surrounding areas. Um, so this is, this is complementary data using sort of large scale apps to show the complementary um, moment to moment mechanisms that we can see. So um, in addition to uh, stress and pain, um, I'm also interested in how these cardiovascular signals can increase uh, emotion responses. And these experiments were very much linked to my early work in people with post-traumatic stress disorder, where I became fascinated with this idea that fear is not just in the brain, but it's in the body too. And I wanted to try and understand how these cardiovascular signals could potentially also facilitate fear processing. So I'm um, using the same experimental paradigm where we time lock stimuli to precise time points. Um, I time locked either fear faces or neutral faces at points in the cardiac cycle, either um, at T wave when systole is in the brain, heart brain channel is active, or at cardiac diastole when the heart brain channel is quiet in between heartbeats. Um, and I got people then to rate how intense these faces were with the hypothesis that fear faces time locked to cardiac systole would be judged as more fearful, seeing how these cardiac responses could actually boost fear. And that's what we found. So we found this small but systematic effect of these cardiac signals to boost the um, intensity ratings of fear faces when they were time locked to cardiac systole relative to diastole. And the reverse effect was found in neutral items, um, which is aligned with this general dampening down of, of stimuli at cardiac systole. And when we look in the brain, um, we could see that, first of all, there's a main effect of cardiac cycle in the insula. But um, tracking the cardiac modulation of emotion um, was the amygdala, with higher amygdala activity bilaterally to fear faces presented at cardiac systole and the reverse effect um, for neutral fa uh, faces um, which was, again, tracking this uh, cardiac modulation of emotion. So we can see that these internal bodily signals have the potential to change the way that emotion um, is felt. So I talked about the nature of the afferent signals, such as heart rate, heart rate variability, 
how they change and altered in different clinical conditions. I talked about the neural representation of the heartbeat, how this has changed again in clinical conditions and can be a meaningful signal. I talked about the pre-conscious impact of these afferent signals, how they can change things like pain and fear and memory. And now I'm going to talk about uh, another individual difference, which is interceptive accuracy, or the accuracy with which people can um, detect internal bodily signals, such as their heartbeats. And this uh, is a particular domain that's getting a lot of attention at the moment. And I think quite a lot of people equate this with interception, whereas for me, this is only one dimension. And historically, um, this has been assessed using, for example, um, cardiac tests. I think people use cardiac tests most extensively because cardiac signals are discrete signals, so they were easy to quantify. So people wanted to use those um, easily quantifiable signals to see if people had good accuracy into detecting when their heart was beating. And um, historically, people used very simple tests. So they would um, get people just to count how many times their heart beat in a specified time frame. Um, for example, the computer would say start, people would silently count how many heartbeats they had, the computer would say stop, people would report how many heartbeats they counted, say 12, actually they had 25 heartbeats because we were monitoring it, and we could look at a ratio of how many they report relative to how many they actually had to see how accurate they were. Um, uh, and another measure that has been used is looking at synchronicity of an external tone um, uh, and see how it's matched to the heartbeat. So, for example, every time someone has a heartbeat, a tone is either synchronous to it or asynchronous. And the accuracy measure is seeing how well people judge whether tones are synchronous or asynchronous to their heartbeats. This is a much harder task because it's internal, external integration. However, it cannot be um, informed by higher order knowledge of things such as heart rate. And when people have looked at these uh, studies in the scanner, then we can again see this area um, in the insula. So this is the same region that was involved right at the beginning that I talked about the conjunction between emotional feeling states and interception. Um, and the activity in this area and the gray matter volume of this area correlates with individual differences in interception. So people's ability to be accurate at detecting their bodily signals really differs. So some people are very, very good at this. Some people really are not accurate. And there's a massive individual difference in this measure. And we can see that the individual variability in this is correlated with the volume of the anterior insula and the activity of the anterior insula during these tasks. Um, as a means to further understand different systems in the body to look at interception, um, uh, there are a number of other contemporary uh, measures that are being developed. Um, and for people who are particularly interested in accuracy measures, I just finished editing a special issue devoted to interceptive measures, talking about some of the challenges um, and new progress in this area. So in addition to these other measures and this individual difference measure of interceptive accuracy, we can also look at self-reports and beliefs about the body and interception. Um, uh, and this, this, this paper, which um, is, has now been cited over a thousand times, um, which is, I really wasn't expecting that, but it's, I think it really encapsulates something so interesting about interception, which is it's not coupled to conscious access the same way as extraception is. So when you ask people how aware are you or how accurate are you of, you, of sensing bodily sensations, people do not have good insight into this. 
And I believe this is a fundamental difference to the extraceptor system, where providing you are attending to something and providing it is above a threshold, people typically know whether they've seen something, felt something, maybe heard something, but you get interesting coupling with attention and above threshold stimuli of accuracy, uh, confidence correspondence. Whereas for interception, our brains are being bombarded by signals in the body all the time. And actually it's not adaptive to be consciously aware of these all the time. So you have this severing of self-report measures from accuracy measures with interception. Um, and I think this is a fascinating thing, which means that the severing of self-report with accuracy measures means that you get these greater divergences in different clinical conditions um, that we can then study to try and help us understand uh, things like emotion and anxiety. And a lot of the work that I do experimentally at the moment is in individuals on the autistic spectrum. Autism, as many of you know, is a neurodevelopmental condition where individuals display difficulties in understanding their own emotions and the emotions of others. And anxiety is very highly comorbid um, in, this, in this population where the clinic that I was working in um, uh, had, for example, um, over 60% of autistic individuals also had an anxiety uh, disorder. Um, so the, the estimates range in the literature, but from my own experience, um, it's actually much higher than is typically reported. And then from an interception perspective, uh, individuals who are autistic have changes in insular reactivity and connectivity. So this area that I keep talking about, which is involved in the sensing of bodily sensations, and it's involved in also um, emotion processing, is not speaking to the brain or concurrently activating in the same way in autistic individuals. Um, and you also get very altered patterns of insular reactivity and connectivity. Um, and uh, there's like interesting work using uh, machine learning algorithms, looking, for example, at resting state to look at what resting state patterns are most predictive of autistic brains. And um, for example, altered insular connectivity is seen as one of the most predictive um, uh, things for an autistic brain. And something that I find really interesting about um, individuals with autism is they actually have heightened bodily response um, when other people are in pain. So something that's been said is that autistic individuals lack empathy and I disagree with this completely. I do not think this is true at all. And actually, as I said, when you look at the body response of autistic individuals when they see other people in pain, it's actually higher. So they have a higher bodily empathy response. Um, and this isn't just general body reactivity, it's very selective to the pain of others. Um, and actually, the more I work with autistic individuals, the more I realize it's not that, it's not that they don't have empathy, it's often actually they feel overwhelmed by these feelings. Um, and maybe they have impaired interception or precision into these signals. And if I was giving a more clinical talk uh, to an autism audience, I could talk a lot about other features of autism, which is also potentially compatible with impaired interception. So interception is also involved in eating patterns. So knowing when you are hungry or knowing when you are full is also a, 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 a sensation which is sensed. Um, and we know that patterns of intuitive eating, that is eating when you're hungry and, and stopping when you're full, is related to individual differences in this bodily interception and precision. And autistic individuals sometimes have very different patterns of eating. They sometimes um, overeat, uh, so they don't get maybe the same fullness uh, signals. Sometimes they forget to eat, so maybe they're not able to sense bodily signals in the same way. 
Um, there's work that other people have done, and I've done some as well, looking at intuitive decision making, so gut instinct based responses. And there's lovely work looking at algorithms, like complex algorithms underlying decision making. Um, and people don't always know explicitly what those algorithms are, but their choice behavior is often accurate, and they say they're being led by gut instinct, bodily signals, and we can actually monitor signals in the body to see how they influence gut instincts. So you can get these cardiac changes and skin conductance changes that map onto choice behavior before people have explicit insight into why they're making those choices. Um, and individuals who are autistic uh, sometimes say that they make very rational decisions and don't have the same intuitive-based um, responses, which are arguably also underscored by interceptive changes. Um, I talked a lot about how motion processing is um, linked to bodily sensations. Alexithymia um, is a transdiagnostic condition where individuals display difficulties understanding their own emotions and emotions of others. So impaired interception could also underscore difficulties that autistic individuals have in understanding how they're feeling. Um, so. This was the first study looking at interception in autistic adults. And we hypothesized that autistic individuals would have reduced interceptive accuracy, operationalized as, as detect accuracy in detecting their heartbeats. And we hypothesized that in contrast, they would have heightened self-report measures of interception. And that's because we know that self-report and accuracy measures don't always align. And actually, autistic individuals in clinics will often say they feel overwhelmed by bodily sensations. Um, so we, we hypothesize reduced accuracy and higher self-report measures. And using just one of these very straightforward cardiac tests, where they just count how many heartbeats they have in a specified time frame, we could see that at the group level, autistic individuals had impaired interceptive accuracy. Each dot is a person, and the, the red dots are the autistic individuals. And you can see it's not every autistic individual who's impaired in interception. Um, but you can see that there are some who are. And this maps onto also what we know about sensory changes in autistic individuals, where these are not uniform in all individuals, but some individuals, for example, feel very overwhelmed by sounds or lights. And you can also see that that manifests to some individuals more than others. And this is just saying that interception is another sense that might also be altered in some autistic individuals. And this was um, strikingly contrasted to the self-report measure of interception, where you just ask people, how aware are you of bodily sensations? And autistic individuals, nearly all of them said, I'm very aware. So they had this heightened awareness, um, along with this reduced accuracy. And remember this dissociation, because I'm going to talk about it later, in, in um, uh, relation to a clinical trial that we've done. So you can see that they go in a different direction. Reduced accuracy, heightened awareness. And we're then able to look at an error score. So I z-scored these measures to put them into standardized space and then subtracted them. And those individuals who said they were very, very aware but had lower accuracy are the individuals with the most anxiety. So this could be maybe seen as some interceptive trait prediction error um, about uh, beliefs of your awareness with actual accuracy or precision measures. So we wanted to see if we could train people to be more accurate in detecting these bodily sensations, could we reduce their anxiety? And um, we initially just did a pilot experiment to look at this. Um, and this is in healthy, controlled individuals. And then later on, we took it to an autistic group in a clinical trial. And uh, in this uh, training protocol, we had individuals who underwent interceptive training. And we had a matched control group who were repeatedly tested for interception but didn't have any training in it. And we look at anxiety, 
the heartbeat tracking task, which is the one where you count your heartbeats, the heartbeat detection task, where you judge whether tones are in sync or out of sync, and then the Maya is a self-report measure of interception. People had eight training sessions um, with a midpoint assessment session in the middle. And how did we train people? Well, interception is both a state and a trait phenomenon. It's a trait phenomenon in the sense that when you're sitting here at rest, some of you will be interceptively accurate, but many of you will not be because you're at rest. However, if I made you all do star jumps like that for a while, then you'll all start to feel your heartbeat beating more strongly. And so it's a state phenomenon in the sense that you then become more interceptively accurate for your cardiac signals. So we got people to do exercise. We then repeated these interceptive tests, counting how many times your heart beats or playing tones in sync or out of sync with your heart and looking at accuracy. And while this happened, you're having interceptive feedback in the sense that your heart is beating stronger and faster, so you're able to accurately detect it. You've just done exercise. But you're also having extraceptive feedback because the experimenter is saying on a trial by trial basis, accurate, not accurate, or correct, incorrect. And we repeat this over and over again while your cardiac signal returns back to baseline so that you stay within this interceptive channel. And we repeat this a number of times over eight training sessions. And when we assess changes in interception, we do it at baseline. So we don't do any exercise. We're just interested in trait interception when you're at rest. And in terms of accuracy, we are able to make people more accurate using this measure. This is just a simple task where we get people to count their heartbeats. I don't find this data convincing, but data I do find convincing, because that one is just counting, maybe you were guessing. But this one is the um, discrimination task where you judge whether tones are in sync or out of sync with your heart. We ran signal detection analyses looking at D-prime. This is a very hard task. It's internal, external integration. You cannot guess it based on the speed of the tones, because the tone speed is always the same. They're just in sync with your heart or time shifted off um, by 300 milliseconds, and then it's out of sync. It's a very difficult task. So at baseline, um, D prime is clustered around zero, um, but we are able to increase this with training. And in terms of anxiety, we actually saw drop, even as a healthy control population, we saw drops in trait anxiety in the individuals who underwent this interceptive training. That was significant at the group level. In addition, we saw drops in intercept in um, state anxiety, which correlated with the reductions, sorry, which the drops in state anxiety were correlated with the improvements in interceptive accuracy on both this tracking counting task and also this discrimination in sync out of sync task. In addition, we also gave them Maya which is an interceptive questionnaire. And this has different subscales about how you interpret and attend to bodily sensations. And we also found that changes in this questionnaire scale in not worrying about interceptive sensations and attention regulation to interceptive sensations also predicted drops in anxiety. So this tells me there's three things which are important for anxiety. One, you need good accuracy into those signals. That helps you better regulate them. I can talk more about that later. In addition, you need to attend to these signals only when necessary. Anxiety and depression are associated with a bias to self, and that's not a healthy bias to have. You need a bias to attend to the world, but be able to attend to self when necessary. And then finally, you need to not worry about the interceptive signals. They're just your heartbeat and that's okay. So you need precision, 
adaptive attention and they're not worrying about the signals and all of those things selectively predicted a drop in anxiety. We then took this to a full-scale clinical trial in 120 autistic individuals, where we trained them in interception. We called the Interceptive Training Group for short, AD, Aligning Dimensions for Interceptive Experience. We scanned their brains before and after, and then we looked at their changes in anxiety. We looked at a control group of autistic individuals who underwent an active control condition, which was prosody training. Prosody is where you have to identify whether sentences are said in an emotional way, whether it's happy or sad or disgusted. And that's because autistic individuals often have trouble with emotion identification. And they often say they feel very anxious not knowing what emotions other people are feeling and expressing. So we taught them to be more accurate in identifying the emotion embedded in how people are speaking as an extraceptive control condition to reduce anxiety. And what we found was that in these, in these autistic individuals, the so ADs are interceptive um, uh, training group, we found this is D-prime, uh, so this is interceptive sensitivity or accuracy using this very hard internal external integration task and we could train our autistic individuals to become more accurate which I was very happy about um, and then we also okay so this I put this graph in because it's my favorite graph <laughs> um, and I, I don't know if it's anyone else's favorite graph but this honestly fascinates me. I think about this so much. So this is a self-report measure where we ask people, how aware are you of bodily sensations? And do you remember I flagged it before, which said that autistic individuals have low accuracy but high self-report for awareness. And what this graph says, and this effect was so big, and it was uh, really in those people, that if we train people to be more accurate, at detecting when their heart is beating, their awareness for bodily sensations decreases. Uh, which I think is so interesting for symptom reporting. And it says, I believe, and I think it's very compatible with um, predictive coding accounts, that having precision into these signals means they're less intrusive and they pop up less into consciousness. And if we can, and so your brain can cancel them out if you have a precision into them. And if you don't have a precision or an accuracy into them, then they come up more and you get more overwhelmed by them. Um, and this is very compatible with other work, which shows that if you can train people to be more accurate at somatosensory perception, they report less pain. So there's something about precision training actually reducing the, the nature and experience of symptoms. Okay, so that was a little diversion. Back to our main outcome variable, which is anxiety. And we did find a drop in anxiety in our interceptive training condition who underwent this interceptive training. This is now published. Um, eClinical Medicine is the Lancet uh, Open Science Journal. So you can see this, it's published. But what's not yet published is the one-year follow-up data, which we've just done blinded, and the results stayed after one year. So we were able to maintain this drop in anxiety after one year. Um, also, you can see for those people who are clinically minded, although the drop was significant at the group level, the result wasn't necessarily very large. Um, so this potentially says that maybe some subgroups are benefiting more than others. Um, and we actually had a, a threshold that we pre-registered ahead of time, which was a clinically meaningful drop. We called it recovered. I mean, what, it's not really recovery, but it was a clinically meaningful drop, which was a six-point drop in trait anxiety on this 20 point scale, so it is a meaningful drop, and, and below a threshold of 55, which we classified as recovered. And one third of our interceptive training group met this criteria, relative to half in the match control group. 
So maybe when we're trying to understand anxiety and ways to help people with anxiety, that a subgroup have more bodily-based symptoms, and it's that subgroup who may benefit more from these behavioral or body-based targets. We also scanned individuals before and after interceptive training to look at changes in functional connectivity as a function of interceptive training. And we used the insula as a seed, um, as this is the area, uh, which is particularly implicated in interceptive accuracy. And we saw changes in interceptive accuracy were correlated with increases in insular connectivity. Specifically, right insular with this ventromedial prefrontal cortex area, which is this area that's very much involved in regulation and control. So now you're linking this area involved in the sensing of sensations, the insula, with this control area in the brain. In addition, we also found increased left insular functional connectivity with this anterior um, cingulate re region, this ACC region. Um, this ACC region is an arousal uh, area, or I think many of us who work in interception think it's an arousal area in the brain. If you correlate um, uh, internal bodily signals uh, with uh, fMRI activity, you see this ACC area come up, um, and we found that the left insular connectivity was more coupled with this ACC region after training. And this, for me, says that what we're getting is more coherence in um, the neural representation of arousal when you give people this training. Um, and then also I'd like to tell you some of the autistic individuals' reactions to um, the study, because I also think these are potentially informative. So one autistic individual said, as the inner channel gets clearer, the outer channel gets more quiet. And they were really referring to sensory overloads, which lots of autistic individuals have in the extraceptive domain. They sometimes feel overwhelmed by bright lights or um, loud noises. And what this person said was that they were essentially less overwhelmed by this with the interceptive accuracy. And this really makes me think about interception and extraceptive senses like a seesaw. And if people lack this interceptive precision, they may be more sensitive to extraceptive senses like sounds, lights. And if you can increase the precision and accuracy of interceptive sensations, then you get this um, like balancing again and this reduction of sensory, extraceptive sensory overload. That needs to be tested experimentally, but it leads to interesting hypotheses that could be looked at further. Another individual said, when I notice the impacts of anxiety on my body, I'm more aware of them, and I'm able to reassure myself that it's just a physical reaction. So that's a not worrying part, which is also important. I am better at taking deep breaths and trying to slow my breathing and heart rate down rather than letting it spiral. And this speaks to the greater regulation that people are given with greater accuracy. So if you're able to be accurate in when your cardiac responses just start to change, you're better able to regulate them. As opposed to individuals who are autistic who sometimes said that they're only over, um, noticing their body when they were already sort of overwhelmed by um, anxiety. And then finally, someone said, I believe it's increased my awareness of hunger, and as a result, I remember to eat, drink, and go to the toilet. So this is interesting initial evidence to suggest maybe just training in one axis could generalize to other bodily axes as well, but future research needs to look at this. So implications for new treatments. In complementary work that was done um, at UCL that I wasn't part of, they did an analysis in um, the medical records of people in Sweden, and they found that for individuals with severe mental illness, such as schizophrenia, bipolar, individuals who are taking medication for cardiovascular symptoms such as stroke and other things, those individuals were less likely to have schizophrenia or bipolar. In other words, medications that target the cardiovascular system may be protective 
against um, types of serious mental um, disorders. And if you remember, I went right at the very start, I showed the graph that showed that high resting heart rate is actually predictive of schizophrenia. So m we have not seen big changes and developments in neuroleptic drugs for schizophrenia. And I do wonder if the brain is not enough and maybe we need to be targeting the body in all different types of mental health conditions. And I honestly believe that that's where we're gonna start to see the breakthroughs, that we've been in the era of the brain. It's given us answers, but not enough answers. And actually, our brains and our bodies are dynamically coupled, and these different peripheral systems have the potential to be informative mechanisms that help influence the onset and maintenance of a variety of different mental health conditions. And I do wonder if that's where the future is going. So to conclude, interception can be delineated across different levels. I've talked about many of those levels today and different bodily axes. I focus on the heart. Some of these levels correspond and others are dissociated and a comprehensive normative understanding of these different interoceptive levels will help us investigate and understand where then, when they are selectively altered in different clinical conditions. And it's my hope that this will lead to new novel treatments. These may be behavioral routes that target these systems, or they could be pharmacological. Um, mechanisms um, with peripheral based action. To conclude, um, thank you to uh, my collaborators. Science is made wonderful by sharing it with friends and I'm so pleased to have worked with so many amazing people. Thank you to the EU as well who funded a lot of this research. The EU is a wonderful thing um, and thank you for listening. Gabriela Buttini, University of Pavia. Thank you very much for your wonderful talk and uh, the immense amount of results. Uh, the su suggestion I'm taking at home is that there is uh, a 